Gloucester, Massachusetts is America's oldest seaport. For most of its 400 year history, Gloucester was the fishing capital of the world. Its lifeblood is dangerous and costly. More than 10,000 people have left this port and lost their lives in the Atlantic. When disaster strikes, few live to tell the tale. But one fisherman's story of survival at sea surpasses all others, and his ambition and daring made him a legend in Gloucester and one of the most celebrated seafarers in history. I'm Corey Kukuru for 1623 Studios, and this is the story of Howard Blackburn. Howard Blackburn was born on February 17, 1859, in a small cottage in Port Medway, a booming lumber town on the southern coast of Nova Scotia. The Blackburns were a fishing family, and Howard's fascination with the sea was instilled at a young age. His rough and tumble father and grandfather both earned a living on the water. Howard spent his formative years swimming, sailing, and rowing the Medway River with his seven siblings. He was exceptionally strong and independent for a child obsessed with becoming a man. It was obvious to the Blackburns that young Howard was going to forge his own path, whether they liked it or not. At age 10, he skipped school constantly to work at a sawmill. Howard's parents punished him over and over, but relented and let him live with a tradesman so he could earn $6 a month building cabinets. But woodworking bored Howard, so he fled the sawmill when he was 11 walked over 20 miles to the town of Bridgewater, and became a lumberjack. Before he was a teenager, Howard toiled with rugged outdoorsmen in an unforgiving part of the world. He developed a man's build. While on the job, he saw a depiction of Columbus landing in the West Indies, which further inspired him to sail the world. Further, because the Blackburns already boasted one world traveler, though Grandfather John's adventure was quite unintentional. A few winters before Howard's birth, John Blackburn and two crewmen planned a routine sail on his pinky boat 80 miles northeast to Halifax to exchange goods for booze. They brought no navigational equipment. Hours after departure, a violent nor'easter blew them off course, setting them adrift for days. They maintained composure and followed the wind, pleasantly surprised with the unseasonably warm February weather. 42 days later, they landed just south of Halifax, 2,000 miles south, in St. Martin. They returned to Port Medway nearly a year later, astonishing family and friends who thought they were dead. Howard's life at sea got off to an equally inauspicious start. He and a young friend were fishing off Pudding Pan Island when their boat flipped. Howard swam for an hour before a fishing crew pulled him aboard. The incident didn't shake his faith, nor did the deaths of his father, Bill, who capsized and drowned in the Medway River, and his older brother, Will, who was lost at sea. Instead of spooking Blackburn, Howard became more adamant about becoming a sailor. The captain who found Blackburn treading water gave him his first job as a fisherman. Barely a teenager, Howard began sailing on American and English vessels from pole to pole, learning the seafarer's lifestyle, and more importantly, the behavior of the global waterways. Now 20 years old, Blackburn was burly, worldly, and could handle his rum. But deep down, Howard believed the biggest test of manhood was to go schooner fishing in the treacherous banks of the North Atlantic. In his eyes, there was only one place in the world where that could happen. In April of 1879, Howard Blackburn arrived in Gloucester. For three years, he earned a solid reputation amongst the Gloucester fleet fishing non-stop until Christmas, when he'd return to Port Medway to visit family. It was during a break in January 1883 that Blackburn learned of a last-second opening on the Grace L. Fears, an 80-foot schooner known as the queen of the ultra-competitive halibut fleet. The Fears made top money and hired the best crew. It was a golden opportunity. On January 21st, 1883, the Fears left Nova Scotia for the 400-mile trek northeast to the churning Bergio Bank off Newfoundland in a mad rush to be first to market. On the third day, the Fears set anchor. The crew broke off into pairs and manned six dory boats to set trawl lines. The dories were 18 feet long, flat-bottomed, and open. Nothing more than simple rowboats. 
Blackburn was 23 years old, 6 foot 2 and over 200 pounds. The only newcomer on the crew, he was paired with Tom Welch of Newfoundland. Welch was younger and lighter than Blackburn, but had experience on the fears. That morning, the two set a half mile of trial line, then returned to the schooner from Mugup. The seas and sky were calm, but the captain sensed an impending storm and ordered the crew to retrieve the trawl lines just two hours after setting them. Passing on the potential haul was costly, but not worth the risk. As Blackburn and Welch rode past the other dories to collect their line, a quiet snow began to fall. The wind blew from the southeast, a good sign. They rode on. Suddenly, the air became quiet. As the other dories headed back, a different wind arose, this time from the northwest, and soon it turned fierce. In an instant, Blackburn and Welch were caught in a squall. They rode furiously, but lost their bearings. The other dories seemingly vanished. Hours passed. Thinking they rode past the fears, they dropped anchor. By nightfall, the snow lessened. The fears raised a signal torch to guide the lost crewmen. Now and then, the undulating ocean cruelly bobbed the dory just high enough so that Blackburn and Welch could catch a glimpse of the fears, but it was too far away. All night, Blackburn and Welch took turns bailing and rowing, but the wind and surf were so vicious that with each stroke, the two actually lost progress. Gear on the dory began to freeze, forcing Blackburn and Welch to dump any excess weight overboard including tubs of trawl lines. They had no fresh water or food except the fish they caught, and that ice solid. The fears was well out of sight by then. To keep from drifting further, Blackburn and Welch dropped anchor again. For hours, they bailed. When Howard removed his mittens to better handle the bucket, Welch accidentally bailed them away. It was then that Tom Welch noticed that Howard's hands were gray and crystallizing. Blackburn tried putting his socks on his hands, but they too froze and were lost. The only way he could be useful, he thought, was if he bent his fingers around the oars to freeze in place. To curve his fingers in position, he smashed his hands repeatedly on ice in the boat that had begun to weigh the vessel down. Then he gripped the oars. Welch was horrified. Even worse, he was discouraged. Late into their second day adrift, Blackburn noticed that his dory mate had stopped bailing. Howard barked at his partner to startle him, but Tom's expression was blank. I'm blind, said Welch. There's no use. We can't last another night. Blackburn broke his hands from the oars, laid Welch down, and started bailing. Welch, crazy from thirst, tried jumping out. Howard pulled him back and fed him ice, but all Welch could do was mumble prayers. The surf was relentless. Howard rode towards what he hoped was the coast of Newfoundland, but there were no signs of land. Welch was catatonic. Occasionally, he blurted Blackburn's name. When Howard turned to bail again, Welch was dead. Frostbite swelled Howard's hands so badly that he couldn't put Welch's mittens over them. Instead, he put his hands between his legs, crouched down to avoid the gales, and rocked back and forth to stay awake through the night. He watched helplessly as Welch's oars spilled overboard. On the third day adrift, sunrise oversaw a calm sea. The storm finally passed. Blackburn and his gear were encased in ice, which burdened the dory. He was wonderstruck to see that his anchor lines had frayed to threads, yet froze solid, keeping the vessel from tipping overnight. He repaired what he could and continued rowing. By noon, his finger flesh began breaking off like dry powder, the blood freezing instantly. He rode on instinct alone, bone on wood. Far in the distance, Blackburn eyed a snow-covered rock. He spent the entire day and night rowing, bailing, and cowering just to stay alive. Four days into an endless odyssey, Howard Blackburn approached land. The snow-covered rock he zeroed in on was an uninhabited island but soon he found other clusters of rocks. Again, he rode for the entirety of the day. By evening, a coastline appeared. There were no homes or harbor, but steep, snowy bluffs to follow. He fought a swift tide. Finally, there was a positive sign. Blackburn noticed two distinct colors of rushing water. He figured he was at the mouth of a harbor where fresh river water flowed into the sea. Adrenalized, 
He rode until spotting a broken wharf and abandoned shed, a mere footprint of human existence, but inspiring nonetheless. As he looked for signs of life, a curious thing happened. He got desperately thirsty. Voices of former shipmates taunted him that he wouldn't make it. Delirious and defeated, Blackburn backtracked to the lifeless hut. When he finally reached shore, Blackburn stood up to drag the dory onto land but stumbled. His feet were frozen. He stomped through knee-high snow to the shed. The roof was gone, a table and bed covered in drifts. There was a half barrel of salt cod, but he had enough sense to realize eating salt would kill him. So he chipped through the ice and laid fish in the snow, hoping to draw the salt out. It never occurred to Howard that some of the cod and halibut he and Welch caught four days earlier was still in the dory. Sitting in the dilapidated shed, Blackburn noticed the silhouette of a schooner on the black horizon. Now he knew there was a harbor close by. The plan was to spend the night in the hut, then row at dawn. He found some flint, but was incapable of starting a fire, so he balled up old fishing lines and nets to use as a pillow and blanket. Still exposed to the elements, Blackburn shivered uncontrollably. If he slept, he'd die, so he spent the night pacing and crawling on the floor eating snow. At dawn, Blackburn heard the dory thrashing against the flat rocks. It was fractured and flooded. Tom Welch's body had warped grotesquely. While repairing the boat, he heard a faint gunshot. Howard remembered that in the winter, successful fishermen often stayed in cabins at outposts with their families to hunt. He screamed for help, but his calls went unanswered. The thought of human contact brought another sudden rush of thirst that triggered a second bout of delirium. Convinced that the old wharf must have a freshwater well, Blackburn crazily waded and dived through waist-high snow, searching for low points in the drifts. There was no well. When Howard regained his senses, he went to shore to repair the dory. First, he had to drag Tom Welch off the boat. He used a gaff to pull the body close. But when he tried lifting Welch, Howard suffered an excruciating hernia. As he pushed the bulge of organs back into his body, he watched Welch sink to the bottom of a tidal pool. Blackburn yanked the dory away from the surf, biting down on the anchor line to hold the boat in place between crashing waves. He drained it, filled the keg with snow, took one last look at Tom Welch's floating body, and pushed off to row. Hugging the coast, he sloshed through one featureless cove to the next. Then, a glimmer of hope, two schooners on the horizon. Blackburn made an immediate beeline and got close enough to see a man on deck, but the wind shifted and pushed him away before getting spotted. It was devastating, but Howard kept on. The leak worsened and the sea got choppy. Snow started to fall. Blackburn turned all the way back to the hut to regain whatever strength he had left. That night, he rode along the opposite side of the bank. Chunks of ice perilously floated by. There was fresh water somewhere. He was one mile beyond where he reached the day before when he noticed a cluster of cabins in the moonlight. Blackburn fought the current, zigzagging at a glacial pace. Every time he stopped to bail, he lost progress. But the battered dory finally reached a frozen inlet. A group of men crossing the ice stopped in their tracks, stunned beyond belief at the sight of a haggard, lone voyager willing his pitiful boat to land. They sensed the enormity and the emergency. After five days and nights of hell in the North Atlantic, without food, without hope, without the use of his hands or feeling in his feet, Howard Blackburn was about to be saved. But as the shadowy figures on the ice slowly came into focus, Blackburn had no idea that his road to recovery had only just begun.